So I'm going to review the definition of the graph partitioning problem. It's how we model a problem where there are a whole bunch of different tasks. Those are the nodes in the graph. And the edges represent how much those tasks have to communicate. And we want to spread all the, the jobs out over a parallel machine and balance the load. That's what we're using it for. And that problem, as I'll uh, describe to you, turns out to be something called NP-hard. So getting the perfect answer is exponentially difficult. We can't do that. It's much more expensive than the original problem we want to solve. So we have lots and lots of heuristics. And I'll overview those heuristics. But briefly, it depends on what information comes along with your graph. There are a lot of graphs which come from, say, a finite element model or where you're modeling some sort of physical system where the vertices in the graph actually come with coordinates, with spatial coordinates, x, y, or x, y, z coordinates, because you're partitioning space. And so there are a bunch of, of uh, techniques that assume that information is available. But of course, there are a lot of other graphs that don't have x, y, z coordinates. For example, in a model of the World Wide Web, the nodes are web pages. There's no x, y, z. And in that case, the only information we have is who is connected to whom, and our heuristics will depend on just the connectivity. The other thing is a very big idea, which happens throughout scientific computing, is that most of the graphs we want to deal with are so large, we really can't apply the most basic algorithms that I'll start by telling you about. So instead, what we're going to do is approximate our graph by a smaller graph. The simplest thing you can imagine is throw away every other vertex and just keep what's left and all their edges. And then, what we, since that graph is half as big, we can imagine trying to partition that and hope that's a good starting guess for the partition for the entire problem. And of course, if you take a large graph and take every other vertex, it's still really big. How do you solve that? Just apply the same idea recursively. Take half the nodes of what's left. And so that recursive algorithm actually goes very, very fast, and that's what we'll be talking about. And then at the end, I will uh, you know, give you some examples and com comparisons of how fast these algorithms work. And then I'll talk about a, uh, and this is going to go into the next hour, or the, the next lecture on Thursday, is that there's a better model of a computation for some computations than a graph. It's called a hypergraph. And sometimes that does a better job of modeling the load balance and the communication. And there are somewhat more sophisticated algorithms for uh, partitioning those. So let's go back. Oh, that was quick. And uh, talk about a graph and, and what information I'm going to assume to you is available. So I'm going to have nodes, which I've uh, labeled in blue here, or the vertices. I'll go back and forth in notation. And I'm also going to have weights. Each one can have a weight, because each of these vertices is going to represent a job that I need to do, and not every job takes the same amount of time. So the weights are the amount of work you have to do. And then there are the edges, and which connect vertices, representing communication that has to happen. And again, not every communication is the same, so there will be edge weights as well to say how much has to move from this task to that task, in which, in this case, it's two pieces of information. And so my job then is if I have P processors, is going to take the vertices, the jobs, and partition them into P roughly equal pieces. So N1 through NP is my disjoint partition. And hopefully the, the sum of the weights in each partition is going to be about the same. It doesn't have to be perfect. And I want the sum of all the edges, the edge weights that connect one partition to the other, that represents communication that's going to go from one processor to another, to be as small as possible. And the, and the special case in which I'm going to spend most of my time, it's going to be the building block, is just break it into two. So I'm just going to assume I have two processors. And once I can break it into two pieces, I'll just apply that idea recursively and break it up as often as, as necessary to get to P. So the output of the algorithm is going to look something like this. If I have four processors, I'll try to break it up into these four groups. So each of the colored boxes is a processor, and it gets two nodes. And if I add up the weights, so here, nodes 7 and 8 have weights 3 and 1. So there's a total of four units of work assigned there. 1 plus 3, four units there. 2 plus 2, four units there. It's kind of reasonably load balanced. And how much communication is there? Well, I only look at the edges that go from one colored box to another, from one processor to another. And so that big 4 in there, that's on processor communication. It doesn't count, so that's cheap. And and, but I do have to send 2 plus 3, or 5 words of information between the blue and the green, and 1 plus 2 or 3 between the blue and the red. And so if I sum up all of these black edge weights that go from one color to another, that's my goal to minimize that. So, uh, any, so that's the basic definition of the problem. And now we're going to give some examples and some uh, heuristics. So any questions about the definition? Because I'm going to use this notation now, marching forward. Uh, yes, and please, here's the mic. Seems like the best solution is just to have one big community. 
And if everything fit on one processor, that would be no parallelism whatsoever. And so hope, the, 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 where does this number P come from? It comes from how much parallelism I hope to attain in the problem. Okay. Okay, so we're using P as our as a kind of uh, a limit or something that, that we're right, required right. to have P. To so, so, this is a que so there's another question of how do I choose P? It may be that if I have P processors, I might, let, let's say, um, 16 processors, I might want to break it still up into 32 or 64 chunks of work, and then I can, uh, as time goes on, assign those to, prob to problems and uh, if to do dynamic load balancing. So there's, there's all sorts of room for, you know, for to do things in here. There was another question? So these edge weights across nodes are the cost of communicating from that node to that node? That's right. So, so this percentage. one represents the fact that that vertex 6 and vertex 3 have to send one word of information between one another oh, okay. so it's in order to do the job. Amount of, trans of, M amount of communication. And sure. I will have specific examples where I show you where this comes from. And in fact, I'm going to use sparse matrix vector multiply as my canonical example. And these, these are going to re represent the number of um, vector components that need to be sent from one processor to another in order to accomplish your sparse matrix vector multiply. So it doesn't necessarily factor in different costs of communicating to different processors. Like if processor one so, so, was close so what I could So the question is, suppose I had a hierarchical machine. Uh -huh. And so some of these processors were all located in a single node and communicate with, could communicate with one another more rapidly. So what I would do is I'd apply this idea hierarchically. I would first partition it between nodes, assign big chunks of work to a node, and minimize internode communication. Then I'd look inside that node and do the partitioning again. Got it. Thanks. So yeah, so it's quite flexible in that regard. So here's some applications. And the very first application for which this algorithm was invented was designing the tele uh, telephone network. And uh, it was uh, invented by a guy named Kernahan. Does anybody else know what Kernahan invented? Yes, you've had this course before, but go ahead. Well, uh, he, he wrote the book, uh, Kernahan and Ritchie C, although he gives credit to Ritchie. Yes, Ock. He's the, uh, the, the letter in Ock, the K. Uh, he invented the word Unix, and, um, and one other thing, he wrote the first Hello World program, or at least he wrote it in the first textbook. So yeah, so he's invented a lot of things early on. And so we're actually going to use an algorithm of his as one of our building blocks called Kernahan Lin later in the lecture. So the, the second application is the main one that's motivating us. It's load balancing while minimizing communication. And my canonical example, as I said, is going to be sparse matrix vector multiplication. So what is the, the graph that comes out of this? I'm going to, let's suppose it's a square matrix, little n by little n. I'll have one um, vertex per row of the matrix. And, I'm going, and so that means each processor is going to be assigned some subset of the rows of the matrix. And, is going to, and I'll have lots of details of this later in the next slide, in fact. And then the number of weights is going to be the number of non-zeros in that row. That's going to be the number of multiplies and adds required to multiply that row of the matrix times x. And then we'll see what the edge weights are later. It's used in VLSI layout. In that case, you have a whole bunch of units you want to place on a chip. Those are the nodes. The edges are wires, and you want to minimize the wire length, because that's where you pump a lot of energy into a chip to, to pump up the wires. And we're going to use it later in the course in sparse Gaussian elimination. That has enough in common with sparse matrix vector multiply that, it, that graph partitioning will tell us how to reorder the rows and columns to minimize the amount of fill-in, because when you do Gaussian elimination of sparse matrix, it's going to get more and more non-zeros as you go along. We want to minimize it. This is the algorithm you use for that. And there's all sorts of other places. It's widely used in image segmentation, for example, that was pioneered by uh, Jitendra Malik here in, in the department. But let's go back to sparse matrix vector multiply, which is the most basic uh, algorithm, we'll, and we'll, uh, we'll use this on throughout the semester. So here's my uh, small sparse matrix, so I can draw all the details here. And I'm going to uh, break it up into, uh, let's say, four processors, and I'll color code it. And so here's the matrix. Each dot represents a non-zero, and here's the graph. So these two are isomorphic in a lot of ways, and so sometimes I'll talk about sparse matrices, sometimes graphs. And so here I have one node numbered from 1 through 8, corresponding to every row and column of the matrix. And for every non-zero, I have an edge. So because there's an, uh, an edge from, uh, because there's a non-zero in the 1, 2 entry, there's an edge from vertex 1 to vertex 2. And this matrix is symmetric. You may notice that you know, if ij is non-zero, ji is. 
And that corresponds to the fact that this graph has no arrows. It's an undirected graph. So sometimes we're interested in non-symmetric matrices, but for the moment, let's just think about symmetric ones. I'll get to the non-symmetric case later. And so, let's, so how am I going to partition this, this problem? Let's suppose, very simply, the blue processor gets rows 1 and 2. So the blue processor owns all the blue dots. The red processor gets rows 3 and 4. It owns all the red dots and so forth. I want to multiply y equals y plus a times x. And to get started, this, so this pro the blue processor is going to be responsible for computing y1 and y2. The next processor do y3 and y4 and so forth. But to get started, processor 1 owns x1 and x2. The, next pro the red processor owns x3 and x4. And so there's where the communication comes from. I have to send the, all these entries of x around. So for example, in or processor 1 needs to multiply that number times x3. It doesn't own x3. So the red processor, see that edge, has to send this piece of information to processor 1 in order for it to compute a sub 1, 3 times x3. So that edge there represents communication. And so, in fact, all of these guys who aren't in the diagonal block represent communication. So those two dots are these two edges, that edge and that edge. And these two dots are represented by those edges. Okay? So what I'd like to do, ideally, is do this partitioning to minimize the number of edges because those represent the number of entries of x that get sent from one processor to another. And here is the code that says, you know, in more detail, everything I just said in English which is that if you, you, if you own a value of x that somebody else needs, then you have to send it to them, and then you have to wait to do the receive to get the entries of x you need, and then you can continue. Okay. So the question is how expensive... So any questions about this, this picture before I go on? So how many... So let's suppose I wanted to find the very best partitioning. How many partitions are there to actually search over? Let's suppose I just wanted to divide the graph into two parts. So there's n choose n over 2 different ways I could do that, right? I have n vertices. I can choose, uh, I want to divide it in half. So there are n over 2 different partition, uh, subset. A, a partition has a size set n over 2. So this uh, combinatorially large number is how many different possibilities there are. If I actually wanted to try every possible way to partition this graph into 2, and indeed, and, and that's really way more expensive than you're willing to pay. But it turns out that if you want to find the optimal partition, find the way to break it up into pieces, which is truly load balanced and minimizes the number of edges crossing from one processor to the other, nobody knows an algorithm that doesn't cost exponential time. That's why it's called NP-complete. And so that's why we're going to be working on heuristics for the rest of this lecture in order to figure out the right way to partition it. So even dividing it into two is NP-complete. So let me give you an overview of the heuristics now. And the first heuristic is we're going to use repeated graph bisection. So here is a, a, an obvious graph that you might want to bisect uh, or partition into different parts. And so what we're going to do, ideally we want to break it up into p parts where p is the number of processors. All of our algorithms are going to have the property that they will tell you how to break it into two parts. So here's an example. I want to take this creature and break it up into two parts. And intuitively, that means I'm going to remove all these edges down the middle, and the blue will be one partition, the black is another, and there aren't very many edges across from black to blue, so this is a good partition. And if I need more than two, I'll just repeat the same algorithm recursively to each half. So all my algorithms, henceforth, are going to be graph <coughs> bisection, and just imagine doing it recursively. Yes? Que uh, please use the mic. Small question, but why there is a red patch in the middle? There's a blue. Where, where is there a red edge? There where? is a. There is three colors: blue, black, right. and red. Right. That's <laughs> the next the slide. Red. I will. Do, I will say why there are three colors in the next slide, because there are actually two ways to separate the graph. You can separate them by removing edges. Those are the red edges in the previous picture, or you can um, break up a graph by removing vertices. And there are algorithms for both. And I will you know, use whichever flavor of algorithm is most convenient, but let me now explain why there are these two kinds of separators. There's an edge separator, and what that is, it's a subset, E sub S, of all the edges, with a property that if you remove it, then you end up with two partitions that aren't connected anymore, and hopefully of roughly equal size. So in this simple 5 by 5 mesh, the green edges are a are one edge separator, obviously it breaks it up, and the blue edges are a different one that would break it up into roughly equal halves. 
The other kind of separator is a vertex separator. And that is a subset n sub s of the nodes where if I remove all those vertices and the edges that touch them, I have broken up my graph into two e roughly equal sizes. So here, in this picture, it's the red vertices. And if I remove all of them and the edges that touch them, which is the green and the blue and those vertical ones, then I have also separated the graph into two roughly equal pieces. Now, it turns out that the algorithms I'm going to tell you about, some of them discover edge separators, some of them discover vertex separators, or just different ways of formulating the problem. And I just want you to know that if I, no matter what I want, if I find one, I can create another one. So, for example, if I know, if I have found um, an edge separator, if I found all of these uh, green edges, then I can always make a vertex separator by picking an endpoint of each edge and removing that, right? That, if I remove all the red endpoints of the green edges, then I've clearly removed all the green edges, and so I get a separator. And going the other way, if you give me an edge separator, excuse me, if you give me a node separator, if you give me the red points, then I can easily build an edge separator just by removing all the edges that touch them. So this doesn't necessarily give you the smallest edge separator, because here if I remove, if I take all these red uh, vertices and remove the 2 plus 2 plus 2 plus 2, whatever number of edges that touch them, I'm removing more than the minimum 5 number of edges that an edge separator would cost. So I can grow by a factor of d, which is the degree of the graph. But most of the graphs that we have, and here the degree is 4, 1, 2, 3, 4. So most of the time, you know, we're not going to worry about that. Our graphs are going to have pretty small degree that we're interested in partitioning. Okay. So that's, so from now on, I'll just use either edge or vertex, either one. Whichever one the algorithm wants to come up with, I can always get the other one. So the next one is nodal coordinates. And so... Uh, so the question is, do I, use, do I have this extra information? Do I have an XYZ or an XY coordinate that goes along with each vertex? And so here is a, is a picture of a typical graph that comes from a finite element model. This is built into MATLAB, by the way, so you can always pop up this graph in MATLAB if you like. And so here is an edge, uh, a wing, and there's a mesh around it, which is, uh, gets smaller and smaller as they get closer to the wing. And this would be used, for example, for simulating airflow around the wing. And the mesh points get much closer together near the wing because you're interested in all the details of the turbulence near the wing. So here, and so there's a, there's a, there's a number, there's you know, work to do at each vertex in this graph, and the edges represent communication, so this is the guy I want to partition. But I want to take advantage of the fact that I know who's close to whom just based on their xy coordinates. And so I'll, I'll start by talking about that set of, of graph partitioning algorithms. And then I'll do ones where you don't have xy coordinates, like it's the web. And it's just, you know, who's connected to whom. And then uh, I'll get back to the idea of multi-level acceleration, where I take this big complicated graph, keep only every other point, throw away half of them, use that, solve that problem, use that as a starting guess, and use that idea recursively. OK. So let's go now and talk about how to use the nodal coordinates when I have x, y, or x, y, z coordinates to do the partitioning. And so let me start by telling you about a motivating theorem, which um, it goes back a long ways to Targin and Lipton in 1979. And a so let me tell you what a planar graph is. A planar graph is the kind that professors always draw on the board. You have a bunch of vertices, and you connect them with edges, and the edges do not cross. If you can draw the edges, if you can draw your graph that way on the board, then it's called a planar graph. So obviously there's some graphs. If everybody's connected to everybody, some edges will have to cross, and that's not a planar graph. And it's clear that if I have a very simple one, let me go back to this picture. If I have a, just a mesh, with, which is an m by m mesh, so m squared vertices all together, I only have to remove the square root of the number of vertices edges in order to break this up, right? Because that's, it's just a square. So the question is, how does that generalize if all I know is that I can draw the graph in the plane without getting two edges to cross? And this beautiful theorem says that if my graph is planar, it's almost like a mesh. If the graph is planar, I can always find a node separator with the following property, that I can you know, break it up into the separator, everything on one side of the separator, everything on the other side of the separator. It's almost equal. Neither of the two big chunks is bigger than 2 thirds. So it's, it's most 2 to 1 ratio in my, in my breaking up. And how many vertices are in the separator? It's not quite the square root of n, but it's only larger by a factor of the square root of 8. 
So all I, and that's all, all I'm assuming is that you know I can draw the graph on the board without having edges cross, and it's almost like a mesh. And so that intuition is something that we'd like to capture in the algorithms that uh, that we can take advantage of. So, are there, so there are any questions about this theorem, which I'm not going to prove. I mean, it's a it's a deep result, but it's the motivation for our nodal stuff. Because if I know the nodal coordinates, I know who my nearest neighbors are in the plane, and I'm, I'm going to be connected to them, but I'm not going to be connected to other nodes that are far away, whose you know, x, y coordinates are far away. So that's what I'm going to try to take advantage of. And so the first algorithm for doing this is based on a very simple physics intuition. It's called inertial partitioning. And so, what I'm gonna, so here are my vertices. And remember, I don't care what their edges are anymore. I only care about their x, y coordinates. So I didn't even bother drawing the edges. And so this is all I need to know, where the vertices are. And so what I'm going to do is choose a line with half the vertices on one side and half on the other. And, if I ch and, so, and then I'm going to assume that the only edges that are going to cross that line, they're not going to be very many. It's only going to be you know, sort of nearest neighbor connections. So it's like drawing a vertical line down the middle of my 2D mesh. The question is, how do I pick that line in general if I have points kind of scattered around? And so I'm just going to draw the picture in two dimensions where I draw a line. But this actually works if I have three dimensions. It's, the idea of planarity doesn't make any sense there anymore. But in that case, it's almost the same algorithm. In that case, I'd pick a plane. And whichever vertices are on one side of the plane go in one partition, the other side of the plane go in the other. But let me just draw the picture for everything being in two dimensions. So what I want to do is choose a line somehow, and then choose a perpendicular line to it, and move it so that half the points are on one side and half are on the other. So I have to choose my line first. And the cleverness comes in choosing the line, but let me just pick one there. And I'm, I'm going to partition it by saying, uh, I'm going to assume I pick a point. It's going to go through the point x bar, y bar. And I'm going to, uh, so, th so this point, this line goes through x bar, y bar. And I'm going to pick the perpendicular. So a comma b is a little unit vector that's perpendicular to that line. So I have to pick those, but in the, for just for the moment, let me assume that I've picked them somehow cleverly. So I've, the line goes through x bar, y bar, and it's perpendicular to a, b. So what do I do once I've chosen that line? What I'm going to do is take each of the points and project it to the line. Just drop a perpendicular. And that's not hard to do, so I'm going to compute all these coordinates. And that's just a little you know, dot product. Then what I'm going to do is basically compute the median of all of those projections. And so there's the median. It's that red dot. That means half the points are on one side, half the points are on the other. So now I've partitioned it into two halves. And so what I've implicitly done then is, um, you know, this is, all these points that I've colored orange, they're in the one partition. And all these points that are colored purple, they're on the other side. And so there is the L perp, the perpendicular line that I've implicitly drawn to break it up. So the question is, how do I pick L so that I get a good L perp? So, so once I've chosen that, the rest of it's nice and simple. So let me uh, give you uh, two examples here. So here's a mesh of points. And remember, my intuition is I'm connected to my nearest neighbors. It's a planar graph. And so here's one way I could choose that line L, which gives me the this L perp. And here's another reasonable way, maybe, to choose the line L, which gives me this L perp instead. So which one is better? Here, I get four edge crossings. And here, I get, well, however many you want, right? 10, 12 edge crossings. So this is clearly a much better L than that one is. So what, how do I characterize this L as being better than that L? So this L I have chosen in order to, so that if I take the sums of the squares of the distances from every point to that line, it's much smaller for this L than for this L. So what I'm going to do is, this is called total least squares in, in linear algebra. And it's also called minimizing the moment of inertia in physics. So, that, so what I want to do is take every point, take its, you know, drop a perpendicular to this line, sum the squares of all those lengths, and choose the line that minimizes that sum of squares. I'll, I'll tell you how to do that in the next slide. And that gives me this line L. And this is clearly not a very good choice. It's going to have a much larger sum of squares distances. And, um, so the other way you could think about this is suppose that this, were, this black graph were a rigid object, and I wanted to spin it around. And I want to you know, use as little energy to spin it around as possible. I need to pick the axis of rotation so that it's as easy to spin as possible. How hard is it to spin? That's called the moment of inertia. 
And the sum of squares is basically the moment of inertia. And so here I'm minimizing. This is why it's called inertial partition. OK, so the question is, how do I do that? It turns into a 2 by 2 eigenvalue problem. So in order to pick that line. So let me just write it down. And in three dimensions, it would be a 3 by 3 eigenvalue problem. But it's, it's very simple. So here's the picture that I started with. And once I've chosen the point that it goes through, and I've chosen this perpendicular, that determines L. So I'm going to ask the question, how do I determine the point, determine the point x bar, y bar? And how do I determine the perpendicular a, b? So let me now write down the sum of squares of lengths of all the green lines. That's what I want, the sum of squares of the distances to the line. And I'm just going to use something very deep, the Pythagorean theorem. And so th the length of that line is going to be squared, is the, sum, is the hypotenuse squared minus the other side squared. And so that is just, you know, that minus that, you know, sum of squares of the distances. And how do I get this length? I will take the vector in this perpendicular direction, that's minus BA, take the dot product and, and subtract. So this is just the Pythagorean theorem. And then I reorganize the terms to separate out the A's and the B's from the X's and the X bars. And I get this simple quadratic form, A squared times the sum of the squares of the distances from X to X bar, B squared times the sum of the distances from Y to Y bar, and then this cross product term. So these only depend on x bar and y bar. And let me just put that into the, this big number x2. So x2 is that sum. This sum of squares only depends on x bar. There's x1. And there's x3. And then I get this you know, very simple dependency on a, b. And I'm going to write it in this quadratic form. If you, so this is a 2 by 2 matrix. And I'm going to multiply by that column vector. And by that row vector, you get a scalar that equals this. And I want to minimize it. So a and b are unit vectors. I want to minimize it. And from linear algebra, that says that, this, that the answer is the smallest eigenvalue of this little 2 by 2 symmetric matrix. If I, you know, in other words, once I pick this matrix, how do I choose a and b? Choose the eigenvector corresponding to the minimum eigenvalue. And that'll be the answer. So then the question is, how do I minimize the eigenvalue of this matrix? Choose the center of mass. It's a perfectly good physical intuition, and it turns out to be the right answer if you do the calculus. It's this center of mass. And obviously, that's not a very good choice. This, it should be over there somewhere. But that's how it works. And in, the, in a 3 by 3 eigen, if I had this all happening in, in three dimensions instead of two, I'd have a 3 by 3 problem. But it's the same idea. Center of mass and the eigens, eigenvector for the smallest eigenvalue. So any questions about this basic algorithm? Because there's going to be a bunch more. This one kind of works. It's, 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 uh, it's somewhat simple, but sometimes it works fine. Yes? Is there a reason that we're, what is the reason that we're choosing L perp? Is it just to help us find L, or is so, that so, also a So we know how to choose L, and then that, and so the hope is that all these points are very close to L. And then L perp is just going to be, you know, divided in half. Everybody on the left and everybody on the right of L perp. Okay. But when we're partitioning our, our nodes, in general, we're using L, right? No, no. So let me go back to this picture here. So here, the best L is this guy who goes the long way. And I certainly don't want to choose the nodes on one side of L and the other side of L. That's why I want to do L perp. Because the idea is that these nodes are going to be stretched out along the length of L, probably. That's how I've chosen L. So there are probably not going to be many edges going sideways. And that's why I cut that way. And in 3D, it's the same idea. OK. So now I want to generalize this to um, the idea of a plane. I want to generalize the idea of a planar graph to higher dimensions. Now, if in three dimensions, I can draw a graph, and everybody can be connected to everybody, and obviously nothing has to cross. So, but I want to have the idea that somehow you're only connected to your nearest neighbors. So I want to generalize that idea. And so let's see if we can figure out how to do that. And so the intuition, again, is what does it mean to be connected to your nearest neighbors in higher dimensions? Let's just think, of, again, of a, of a mesh, because that's, that's a good intuitive thing. So a 2D mesh, we've already seen that. So imagine you have a 3D mesh. So this is an n by n by n uh, graph. Everybody's connected to their six neighbors, north, south, east, and west, and up and down. And so the question is, what's the best way to partition that? And your intuition, perfectly reasonable, is I'm going to take a plane and divide this mesh in half. 
and I'm going to cut all the edges that go from one side of the plane to the other side of the plane. So if I have, if this is a little n by little n by little n uh, graph, that means I have little n cubed total uh, vertices, how many edges cross that plane? It's little n squared. In other words, the two-thirds power of the total number of vertices. So in the planar case, I had to cut the square root of the number of vertices down the middle. In three dimensions, I'm cutting two-thirds power of the number of vertices. In higher, what do you think you'd, I'd cut in, in four dimensions? Because some graphs naturally live in four dimensions. I'd cut the um, three-quarters power, right? So it gets worse, but it's still, that's the intuition I want to capture for a graph that lives in any number of dimensions. Okay. So what I need, question. I just want to confirm, the statement you have up here, any graph can fit in 3D, are you meaning to say that all graphs can fit in 3D without edge crossing? Or right, you mean because, to say there is it, some set of... No, so, so all I mean is that if I, I can draw, put a graph in three dimensions and draw the edges, which are just one-dimensional things, and since it's in 3D, I can clearly not have them actually touch one another. Ah, okay. Uh, unlike two dimensions. But I, so, but I still want to capture the notion that you're only connected to your nearest neighbors in some sense, and which I will do on the next slide. And there's another question back there. Can I see what INI is? What's IEI? Um, let's see. Uh, right there, that's the absolute value. That oh, is the, I's, the I's, cardinality okay, of the set. Sorry, yes. So, um, so the N, capital N, is the set of vertices. And abs or cardinality of is you know, how many guys are in it. OK, yes. OK, so here is the idea. And this is, uh, goes back to a, a result of Miller, Tang, Thurston, and Vavasis. So a mixture of pure mathematicians and computer scientists who thought of this idea. And so they're trying to define, with these two definitions, they're trying to come up with the idea in, in any number of dimensions, you're only connected to your nearest neighbors. And so let me state the dimensions. The, the, the definitions, and then I'll draw you some pictures of what the algorithm actually does to, to sort of build off of this. And it's going to be a randomized algorithm. It's going to pick a, uh, a random sort of dividing, not plane, but random sphere, and say whoever's inside the sphere is one partition, whoever's outside the sphere is another partition. And with very, very high probability, the number of edges across the sphere hits this lower bound that we're expecting to get. So here's how they set up the theory. I'm just going to you know, state the definitions without proving it all. Is um, a k-ply neighborhood system in a certain number of dimensions is a bunch of closed disks so that no point in, your, uh, in, in that space, in, in d-dimensional space, is interior to more than k disks. So let's look at this picture here in two dimensions. So here are my circles, here are my disks. And pretty clearly, none of these two, they, and the disks only touch at the border. And so there's no point, uh, there's at most one point in the inside of any one of these disks. But I could have drawn this picture with different sized disks and higher dimensions, but this is sort of the picture to have in mind. So let's suppose that I can draw a whole bunch of disks around the vertices in my graph that way. So the question is, how do I define a graph with, with these disks, sort of defining who's connected to whom? So given these disks, I'm going to say, imagine I just expand each disk a little bit so that it might touch and overlap with its neighbors. I'm going to how much am I going to expand it by some little ratio alpha bigger than 1? Let's suppose I expand all the disks by alpha bigger than 1, and then they overlap. So that guy and that guy will overlap a little bit. Then I make an edge. So that's how I capture the notion of nearest neighbors. So I'm going to call a graph an, an alpha k overlap graph. If I can build it, by drawing disks or spheres or, or balls in, uh, you know, in space where there's one node associated with each of those little balls or disks. And when I expand them by alpha, they overlap and I have to draw an edge. So that's the notion that captures nearest neighbors in arbitrary numbers of dimensions. If I can you know, draw, these, uh, draw the disks and pick an alpha and a k. Okay? So let me assume now that I can do that. So the assumption, so you don't have to, you know, when somebody hands you a graph, you don't have to check this. You can just run the algorithm. What the theorem will say is that if your graph has this property, then the algorithm will work with high probability, right? But you can always try the algorithm. Okay. So here's what they said. Let's suppose you have a graph that has this property. You can do, you know, describe it by building these disks, and when you expand them, they overlap, and you draw an edge. 
Then there's a separator. There exists a vertex separator that has exactly the properties we'd expect of a perfect mesh. You can, break, you can, you can separate out N, S, that's the vertex set, and you get the vertices on the one side, you get the vertices on the other. Each one, neither of the two partitions can be very large. They're both you know, bounded away from N. So for example, let's say we're in uh, two dimensions, so it's, it's just a 2D mesh. Then neither, then neither partition can have more than n times 3 quarters vertices, right? So the worst imbalance you can have is 3 quarters on one side and 1 quarter on the other. And in higher dimensions, it gets a little worse. And then, how big is your separator? And the answer is n to the exactly the exponent you'd expect. In two dimensions, it's n to the 1 half. You had to cut you know, the square root of the number of vertices edges, just like a 2D mesh. In three dimensions, it's n to the 2 thirds, just what we thought we would get end of the three-fourths in, in four dimensions and so forth. It has to exist. Okay? So, uh, and so this is a generalization of that first theorem I told you of Lipton and Tarjan, that if it's a planar graph, d equals 2, you can always cut the square root of the number of, uh, the number of nodes is the square root of how many you start with. Okay? So what's the algorithm? The algorithm is that we're going to choose a sphere in, in, in d-dimensional space. So my, my graph lives in d-dimensional space. And the sphere is going to decide whichever edge crosses that sphere, hits the, the surface of the sphere, that's going to be what I cut out. Okay, that's going to be my edge separators. And then, as usual, I'll build the node separators from the edge separators. So the question is, how do I choose this, this magic sphere that divides it? I'm going to choose it randomly, according to a very interesting probability distribution that I'm only going to show you pictures of. And you, if you choose it randomly according to this procedure on the next few slides, it will satisfy the theorem with very high probability. So it's a randomized algorithm. You pick a random sphere in a certain sense. So let me just show you a picture of how I'm going to pick the random sphere. But are there, so this is any questions about this before I just illustrate the algorithm to pick a random sphere? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to start with all of my points living on the plane, so, they all, so, th so this is my plane here, and there's a point, and I'm going to project them to the, live on a sphere, the unit sphere. It's called stereographic projection. And it's a really simple idea. I'm going to draw a unit sphere with a center at the origin. I'll draw a straight line from my point in the plane to the North Pole, and wherever it intersects the sphere, uh, that's the projection on, onto, this, onto the sphere. So P will get projected onto P prime, which is where the line intersects the sphere. And this, it's the same idea in higher dimensions, but let me just stick to two, because I can draw all the pictures. So now I've projected all my points to the sphere, and I'm going to do all my work for points living on the surface of a sphere. Okay. The next thing that you have to do is find the center point. It's a so-called center point of all these projected points living on the sphere. And the center point has the property that if you pick any plane through that center point, it divides the number of points evenly. And there is actually a linear programming algorithm and to find that. But let's just assume for the moment that I can find this magical center point. Okay. And I'll draw a picture on the next slide. Then what I'm going to do is take all that sphere and transform it to move the center point to the origin. Okay. And so and how am I going to do that? The, the center point could be anywhere. So I'm going to take the sphere and rotate it. That keeps it a sphere. That doesn't hurt very much. So the center point is right above the origin. It's sticking straight up. So its coordinates are a bunch of zeros and an R, straight above the origin. Then what I'm going to do is I'm going to unproject it, take all the points, project them back onto the plane, multiply them by a scalar, and project them back onto the sphere. It turns out, if you think geometrically, all that's going to do is move this, vertical, this point vertically, and it's going to put it right at the center going to put it right at the center of the sphere. And now all I have to do is pick a random plane through the origin. And the plane intersects the sphere in a circle. And that magic great circle, everybody on one side is in one partition, everybody on the other side is the other partition. And that's going to be how I do the partitioning. So let me just do it by pictures. So here is my finite element mesh that I'd like to partition. And remember, all I need are the x, y coordinates. I don't need the edges at all, so let me throw away the edges. So all I'm left with are these points. Then I have to project them to the circle. And so when I'm finished with the projection, so I draw a straight line through each of those points in the North Pole, and here where they all live on the circle. And 
by running this approximate linear programming algorithm, there's the center point. It's that heavy black dot. And so the, and it's, it's not in any convenient location. It's just sitting in the middle of three-dimensional space somewhere. So now the next step is I want to sort of rotate this sphere. You can imagine rotating it so that black dot comes up so it's straight over the top, straight over the origin. And then I'm going to dilate it so that it moves into the center. So I've sort of skipped a step here. So I've, I've rotated this up so that black dot is right over the top. I project it back to the plane, just scale it so they move either farther in or farther out, and project them back, and I can put that dot right at the center. And now I can just pick a random plane through the origin. I picked a random plane that's sort of slanted, and it intersects the sphere in this circle, and that circle is my partition. Everybody on one side goes in one's half. Everybody on the other side goes in the other half. And so now, yes, question. Here, just hand it to me. I'll, oh, you got it. Good. Sorry. Uh, how did we originally pick to put, to put the sphere where, or where it is? How did we originally guess where the sphere should be? So, so you can put the sphere anywhere. Anywhere. Oh, anywhere. But it's probably, you know, you might as well start with it around the center of mass. So it's sort of in the middle. But this second process of rotating in dilation would eventually put it back where you wanted it. So now let me go back and project everything back on the plane in the original geometry. And this is where, where that great circle lands. So th when I take a circle on, that, on, on here, I could take any circle. I do a, a projection back on the plane. I just get another circle. That's a property of, of analysis. And so there is going to be my part partitioning. That's where the cuts are going to be. And so if I now put the graph back together, I've cut all the edges uh, crossing where the circle was. And that's going to be how the partitioning works. OK. So those are the two algorithms where if you know your edges, you know the coordinates, the xy or xyz coordinates of, of your nodes, you can use those to do graph partitioning. And with high probability, you get a decent answer. Are there any questions? Um, yes. And I will. So would this algorithm work better than the first one you showed us in a graph like this, where there are edges that uh, connect pretty far apart points? So we are still connected to nearest neighbors here. Yeah. And maybe what's a little bit different from that first example is that there's some points where the, some parts of the graph where things are very close together because I've refined the mesh or something. Um, so, so I think that um, this algorithm is probably more robust, but there is no one best one. I mean, it is an NP-hard problem, which is why you, know, you can keep inventing heuristics that sometimes work. And that's why I can't just tell you one answer for this. So, so I should say that if neither of these algorithms work, you can always use the next batch of algorithms I'm going to tell you about, which ignore the coordinates and just use the edges, right? And that might be what you have to do in some cases. So cause I didn't use anything about edges. I just assumed they were nearest neighbors. But now I'm going to go talk about the edges. Well, as soon as I summarize. Uh, this state of the art. So there are lots of variations in these algorithms. And they're very efficient. As you can see, they're sort of linear in time. They, don't, they don't, didn't work very hard. And they assume that you were connected to your nearest neighbors only, which certainly works in finite element modeling and certain kinds of physical modeling. But you know, there are a lot of other things that don't work that way, which is why we have the other algorithms that really only depend on where the edges are. Um, and so here's an example where you do a really bad job if you did uh, graph partitioning using the algorithm I just showed you. So this looks like a square mesh. And so I would cut it you know, using an edge like that. But you can see it's really just a linear uh, graph. Everybody's connected only to two neighbors. And so if I remove the red vertex, I, in other words, I had a graph separator of size 1, and then it would break apart. right? So obviously here, I would get a lousy answer by using x, y coordinates as opposed to who's connected to whom, which is what the, the rest is about. So, and there's lots of more details about how these algorithms work and proofs and so forth at these various websites. So that ends the first part, which is on uh, nodal coordinates. And the next part is about what to do if you only have edges. OK. And I'm going to start with really elementary algorithms and work up to more sophisticated ones. So the simplest thing you could imagine is breadth-first search, which is a very basic graph theory algorithm. And let me just remind you of what that is. So here I've drawn a graph, and all of these colored lines are edges. I've categorized them by color. And so I've, I choose one vertex, or one uh, node. I'll call it the root. And what I do is I traverse the graph. 
and I label each uh, vertex by how far it is from the root. So the root is at distance zero from the root. Here are all the vertices that are, that are distance one. There are all the vertices that are distance two, distance three, and so forth. And there's a classical algorithm for doing it, but let me not worry about what it is. It's on the next slide. It runs in linear time in the size of the graph. And so when I've done that, I've, I've categorized each vertex, each edge of the graph as one of three kinds. It's either in a tree, these are all the black edges, and those give me the shortest paths from the root to everybody else. So if I want to find the shortest path down here, I just follow the black edges, and I, it takes me four edges to get to level four. They're the black ones. Then there are the red edges, the horizontal ones. Those go from one level to another. And then there are the interlevel edges, because not every edge from level one to level two is in the tree. I have the green ones, too. So on the other hand, there's one kind of edge that can't possibly be in this graph. I can't possibly have an edge that goes directly from level one to level three. Why is that? Yes? Right, if, if there were an edge from, level, from that vertex to that vertex, then this vertex would be, should belong in level two. Right, so this is why it gets categorized this way. So what I've done now, so a natural way to partition this then is to take go down to the middle of the tree somewhere where half the vertices are, are, are at level 0 through 2 and the other half are at levels 3 and 4 and just cut it down the middle. Why is that? Because the way I've built this, this tree is that there are, no, the, there are no edges that cross more than one level. So, so I can be sure there aren't any uncounted edges that go from up there to down there. They're the only ones that are in the middle. Does it always work? No, but you know, again, it depends on the structure of your graph, but this is sort of the simplest thing that you could imagine. And here, let me just say for the, for the non-computer scientists who are, or the people who have not seen this, this algorithm before, it's a nice, simple, linear time algorithm. And here it is in all its detail. Let me just say at a high level, we need a data structure called a queue. And a queue is a data structure where you can put something in at one end, that's an NQ operation, put it in, and then you can take things out at the other end. So it's first in, first out. And that's the data structure we need to make this work. So what I do is I take all my vertices, and I say they're, I haven't visited them yet, I label them as unmarked, and then I stick the root into the queue. And I'm going to process the vertices in order that they come out of the end of the queue. So I stick in the root into the queue, and then I keep processing until the queue's empty. So I, t I say, is something in the queue? Yeah, I just put the root in. Let me take the root out, visit all its neighbors. They're going to be in level one. So I, I label all these guys as being in level one, mark them that I visited them already, and put them in the queue. Then I visit all the level one guys, and all their neighbors are necessarily level two. Stick them in the queue, mark them. And then I'll be, once I finish all the level one guys, I'll have labeled all the level two guys. They're in the queue, they come next, and I process level by level. So it's a perfectly simple natural algorithm, and there's the code if you want to run it. Okay. So as I said, Brett's first search identifies three kinds of edges, the tree, the horizontal, and the interlevel, which can only go from one level to the next. And we've already answered the question, you can't go from level one to level three, otherwise it wouldn't be the right answer. So let's apply this, uh, 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 this heuristic to partitioning our favorite 2D mesh, where we think we know the right answer. And let's suppose I start at the middle of the mesh and apply the algorithm. So the, the guy in the middle is the root. Then these four nearest neighbors are level one. And you can see I've drawn the level lines of the tree. So this uh, square annulus is, is level one. The next square annulus is level two. And the annuli keep growing out and out. And everybody in one annulus is at the same level. So what would my partitioning algorithm say? It would say, go out until I have you know, half the vertices in levels 0 through 3. That's uh, partition N1, the, the blue, and then the yellow, everybody else at levels 4, 5, and 6. They're on the outside. And so the question is, is this a good partition or not? So I've, these diagonal lines are the partition. And the answer is, well, it's still about the square root of the number of vertices, right? It's not a nice, simple vertical you know, cut through it, but it's still proportional. The number of vertices along, that I've cut along that edge, that edge, and that edge is still basically the square root of the graph size. So it still captures roughly the intuition that we had before, what we, how we should succeed. In three dimensions, it would do the same thing. It would be two-thirds. Um, but it's not very neat, but it, it, it does do the right thing. Okay. So finally, 
we get to a more sophisticated one, which is the Hello World guy. And it's called Kernahan Link. And so this is what he originally invented to build the telephone network. And so what we're going to do, it's an iterative algorithm. It's going to take an initial partition and iteratively improve it. So it's going to say, let me just start assuming I have a partition. I'm going to take two vertices and opposite sides of the partition and say, would I do better by swapping them? It's going to keep swapping and swapping until it, you know, it can't find a good swap anymore and then stop. So that's the high-level description of the algorithm. I'm going to describe the original version because it's the easiest to understand. It costs order the number of vertices cubed. It's really expensive. There's a much better version that's linear time, a proportional number of edges, can't do better. Uh, but, but anyway, I won't describe that one. I'll just describe the original one. So here is the idea. And I'm going to assume all of the edge weights are 1. So, I, it doesn't, so all I want to do is count the number of vertices in each side of the partition. So I'm going to start with vertices, edges, and edge weights. And I'll, have a, I'll start with a partitioning where it's equal on either side. So I have a perfect partitioning. And so the question is, how do I tell whether it's a good idea to swap some member of capital A with some member of capital B? So I need to make up some notation in order to do that. So what is the cost? I'm going to use T for the, uh, for the cost. That's going to be the sum of all the edge weights that go from the A side to the B side. And what I want to do is find some subset of the A's and some subset of the B's of equal side and consider swapping them. So that uh, X will t be taken out of A and put in B, and Y will be taken out of B and put in A, and I'll get a new A and a new B. And I want to know, is that a better idea? And so uh, I need a quick way to evaluate the cost of the new, the new cost for the new partitions A and the new partition B. And I need you to compute that as efficiently as possible. And we'll, I'll tell you how to do it in order n cubed, and, you know, but somebody did it in order and number of edges. But the algorithm fits on one slide if, I, if you're willing to, to spend order n cubed. So I'll, I'll do that one. OK, so here, let me just repeat the notation. So T is the cost. It's the, it's the sum of all the edge weights that go from the A side to the B side. And there's the new cost from the new A side to the new B side. And I need an efficient formula that lets me compute the new cost from the old cost. And so how do I organize this? For each vertex, so little a is a particular vertex in the big A side, I'm going to count its cost by summing up all the edge weights from little a to the other side, to capital B. Oops. And I'm also going to have the internal cost. So that's the sum of all the edge weights from little a to everybody else on his same side. Now, why do I need both? Because if I move little a from the big A side to the other side, then external and internal swap. Right? Edges to your, to your, on the same side become the other side and vice versa. So I need both of those, and I just need to subtract one and add the other. And so that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to have the external minus the internal. That's going to be the, relative, the change when I, put, I move little a from one side to the other. It's the difference of those costs. And the same thing for the b side. So let's suppose, let me suppose I've chosen a two contenders, little a and little b, for potential swapping from the big A side to the big B side. So, and so here's the new A and the new B, where I've taken little a out of big A and put them in big B and, and so on. What's the cost? So here is the formula. You can sort of make sure that everything cancels correctly. I subtract out these differences from the external and the internal. And when I do that, I've subtracted out one cost twice, because A and B both switch sides. So I have to add in the, subtract out the edge weight just for A and B. And that gives me the new uh, cost of, of, swap, of my new partition, where I've swapped little a and little b. And that difference there is called the gain. That tells me how much I gain in cost. Hopefully, gain is positive by swapping little a and little b. And now, once I've swapped, and that didn't cost very much. It's, you know, one, you know, it's, you know, it's evaluating this little formula. It's dirt cheap. And, but once I've done that, I have to update all these costs because you know, all the neighbors have changed. And so I take the old difference between external and internal, and I have to update it. It just costs order one because now you know, the neighbors of little a prime on the big a side, you know, uh, little a is not a neighbor anymore on, the, on that side. So I just have to do a little bit of updating to update the new d's. OK. So that's going to be my basic data structures. And so what, so what is the algorithm? I'm going to uh, iteratively pick a sequence of possible little a's and possible little b's to swap, 
and I'm going to order them in by the largest gain to the smallest gain. And I'm just going to keep you know, picking, you know, I'm going to do it until um, all the gains are negative, and I can't, it's not worth swapping anymore. So here's the algorithm that fits on one slide. And uh, so the, and the total cost is going to be n cubed, but we don't, let's not worry about the cost accounting there yet. So I'm going to uh, start with some initial partition that I get somehow, and this I'm going to iteratively improve it. So there's a repeat loop, which is going to repeat until you know, there's no more gain to be had. And so I'm going to update all those Ds. Uh, you know, I have to initialize all of those. And I'm going to unmark all the nodes. So I'm going to try every possible. I'm going to you know, keep picking pairs of little a's and little b's. But I haven't picked any yet, so they're all unmarked. So, let's suppose, so let, while I still have some possible pairs of little a's and b's that I haven't tried yet, I'm going to pick the pair that maximizes their gain. So I've computed all of these values here. And I'll just pick the biggest one. And I'll do that first. I'll, I'm going to mark them, that I want to swap them. But I'm not going to swap them yet, because I might not want to swap them by themselves. I might, might want to swap more. So I'll mark this little a and little b who give me the maximum gain as swapped. Uh, and then I'll update all of the d's. And I'm going to keep repeating that until I've marked everybody. Every pair of little a and little b has been swapped. And they're sorted now in order from largest gain to smallest gain. So, so let me say it again in green here. At this point, I've picked n over 2 pairs, where this guy has the biggest gain, the first pair, then a2, b2 has the second biggest gain, a3, b3 has the next biggest gain. And the question is, how do I choose how to swap? Because I could just swap a1 and b1, or I could swap the first two. You know, a1, a2 get swapped with b1, b2. Or I could swap the first three with the first three. The question is, how do I choose? So what I'm going to do is look at which choice maximizes the gain. Because I know by just adding up the gains how much I benefit by swapping the first k. So for k going from 1 to n over 2, I will ask, is it worth swapping the first k? I'll pick the largest possible gain. Now, why can this win? It could be that initially the gain, I could have some negative gains, that it's not a good idea, that I'm at some sort of local optimum. But if, I, but if I do that temporarily bad thing, it may help me get benefit later. That's why I keep trying all possible pairs. So it may, you know, the gain may be negative for a while, but then it may be positive later. And this lets me try all the possibilities very cheaply. Well, sort of cheaply. So if, if there is some positive gain out of all of those n over 2 possibilities, then it's worth swapping. And then I swap them. And, uh, and I you know, swap all of those with all of those and so forth. And I, then I repeat that until I can't get any more gain. Okay, so this is all, yeah, and so, and I've done all the ac cost accounting, and one iteration here cost me n times n squared, so n cubed. And um, yes, I haven't tried to get every line of code correct, but correctly described, but I think you get the intuition there. Okay. So as I said, the most expensive line is n cubed. So it's, the cost is going to be n cubed times the number of iterations. And I already said this. You know, in the middle of this process, you may have some negative gains, but they may pay off later because eventually the sum gets bigger because you have big positive gains later. And that lets us get out of local minima because there is, you know, this is not a convex problem. We, we may have local minima. And so a question is, how many times do we have to do this repeat? How many times do we pay this n cubed cost of possible swapping and so in the original paper, they did a bunch of tests on what were big graphs at the time and incredibly tiny graphs by today's standards. And it usually worked after two to four sweeps. So it wasn't a, an incredibly expensive process to do this. And since then, people have analyzed this a lot because it's a very uh, a, a theoretical interest. And uh, the probability of convergence in one step drops you know, depending on the graph size. So, but nonetheless, it is, you know, you're always making progress, and the algorithm will, you know, and you can just stop when you've made as much progress as you want. So, are there any questions? That's all I wanted to say about Kernahan-Lin. We are going to use it as a building block later. It's sort of built in as a black box to the later algorithms, which uh, are very fast and work uh, recursively, you know, by multi-level, as I said before. Okay. So that's one building block that we're going to use later. And the other building block is called spectral bisection, which uh, is, uh, is, has another physics motivation. 
So let, let, me, let me give you the physics motivation first. Um, let's suppose I take a string, uh, let's say a, a wire and a piano, and I pluck it. It vibrates. And the, the, the lowest mode of vibration, it's going to vibrate up and down like this. Just, you know, that's the lowest mode. What's the second mode of vibration look like? The second, the second note. You know, one side goes up and one side goes down. Well, I've just broken that string in two, haven't I? When one side is up, those are the positive nodes. One side is down, those are the negative nodes. It divides exactly in the middle, and that's how I'm going to partition a string. It works for arbitrary graphs. So, so I could stop there, but I have to tell you some more about the algorithm. But that's, that's all the intuition. And there's actually a lot of beautiful proofs about why that's a good idea, a lot of theorems. So I'll, I'll just sort of tell you what the results are that say that that is actually, you know, gives you some provable uh, qualities of, of having a good partition beyond that, that intuition. So, the, so but, the, but what I'm going to have to do to make this work is I'm going to have to take my graph and simulate, uh, well, not necessarily a piano string or a trampoline, but, you know, something like that. I will, you know, write down the equations of motion implicitly of of something that's vibrating and ask, what's its second mode of vibration? And use that to actually figure out you know, what's positive and what's negative. And so I need, I'm going to have this big matrix. It's going to be called the Laplacian. We've heard that before. It's going to be the Laplacian of the graph. And I need to find its, second, uh, its eigenvector for its second mode of vibration, for its second smallest eigenvalue. So how do I do that? I have this big matrix. I need to find its, an eigenvalue and an eigenvector. There's an algorithm called Lanchos. That's a standard linear algebra algorithm. What's the inner loop of that algorithm? It's sparse matrix vector multiply. I'm going to do repeated sparse matrix vector multiplications with this matrix that comes from my graph. And, but of course, why did I want to do graph partitioning in the first place? It was to make sparse matrix vector multiply go faster, for example. So I kind of have this chicken and egg problem in that you know, I want to graph partition, I want a sparse matrix vector multiply, so I graph partition, so I sparse matrix vector multiply. And so, so, you know, but it's a good idea. <laughs> And the, and the point is that uh, we're going to, this is useful when you want to do lots of sparse matrix vector multiplies. So it's worth spending a little bit of extra time at the beginning to do the partitioning to make all the subsequent ones go a lot faster. That's the usual situation. If I only had one or two sparse matrix vector multiplies, it wouldn't be worth running this. Okay, but the usual situation is you get a lot. Okay, so here let me now go into the algorithm. And as I said, the Easiest motivation is a one-dimensional mesh. I'm just connected to my neighbors. It's a vibrating string. There's the lowest frequency. It vibrates like this. There's the second lowest frequency, and so I'm going to break it up into the positive and the negative. And, but I could also you know, use a higher frequency and try to immediately break it up into more pieces. Some people do that too, but let me just try to break it up into two and just do partitioning. So let me tell you what the matrices are that I need to write down. Um, So I have my graph G, and I need to write down some matrices that correspond to the physics problem that I just described. And they're, they're very simple matrices that basically record who's connected to whom. And I'll, I'll draw some pictures in the next slide. So the simplest matrix is called the incidence matrix. There's one row for every node. There's one column for every edge. And I just put in a plus and a minus one in, in each column to say, for each edge, who are your endpoints? Right? So it's a very simple graph you know, with the two non-zeros in each column saying who are the endpoints. And so that's going to be the incidence matrix. And I'll draw a picture in the next slide. And then the other kind of matrix I need is called the Laplacian. And we talked about this in Sources of Parallelism. It's, it's coming up again. So if I have a graph, an undirected graph, I can define the Laplacian. And the diagonal entries of that matrix are just the degree of each node, so the number of edges that touch each node. And the off diagonal simply record who's connected to whom. So if there's an edge from vertex i to vertex j, I put a negative 1 in matrix entry ij, and I'm symmetric. So that is called the Laplacian of a graph. And so here are two examples. So here is the simplest graph, uh, just one dimensional. And the edges are numbered in black from 1 to 5, and the uh, edges are numbered from 1 to 4. Here's the incidence matrix, one row for every node, one column for every edge. And I just record that edge 1 connects node 1 and node 2, and edge 2 connects node 2 and node 3, and so forth. It's very simple. And here's the, excuse me, the two-dimensional case. So in this case, vertex 5 is touching edges 
4, 6, 7, and 9. So if I go to row 5, there's an entry in 4, 6, 7, and 9. So it just is plus minus 1s. It's isomorphic to the graph. Here's the Laplacian that goes with it. And these should look familiar from the earlier sources lecture. So down the diagonal goes the degree. So the end, the end vertices are only connected to 1. And everybody else is connected to their two neighbors from left to right. So I have 2s down the diagonal. And this guy, you know, only, most of them, if I had drawn a very big two-dimensional graph, they'd all be 4s. But since this is small, there's only one 4 in the middle. And then, since everybody's connected to their neighbor, I have negative 1s right above and right below the diagonal. And here it's a little more complicated because I'm connected to north, south, east, and west, so I get this pentadiagonal matrix that we've seen before. So that's the Laplacian and the incidence matrix. So let me tell you some simple relationships between these two graphs and matrices and what they tell us about connectivity. And the proofs are on this web page. I won't do the proofs. It's you know, a page of linear algebra. So, so the, for starters, this Laplacian is obviously a symmetric matrix. I built it that way. Right? If, I, if, there's a, if I and J are connected, there's a minus 1 there and a minus 1 there. And so since it's symmetric, what do we know about symmetric matrices? The eigenvalues are real, and the eigenvectors are orthogonal. That's just real you know, linear algebra, uh, symmetric linear algebra. The other interesting property is that I can build the Laplacian from the incidence matrix by just multiplying the incidence matrix by its transpose. So let's just go back and look at that. And so, so, let's just, so what does this mean? This says that if I take the dot product of two rows of this matrix, I get an entry of G. So let's go back and look at that. So I'm going to take the dot product of two rows of this guy. And the question is, do I get something over here? Well, if I take a dot product of this guy with itself, I'm just counting the number of ones. That's the degree. And if I take the dot product of these two, I'm only going to multiply two non-zeros together if there's an edge. Minus 1 times 1, and so I get a minus 1. So for every edge, that dot product tells me, is there an edge? And I get a minus 1 there. So that follows from this. Now, once I know that the Laplacian can be written this way, I know more about the eigenvalues. In fact, I know that they're all non-negative. They all have to be at least 0, because I've, this matrix kind of has a square root. So the eigenvalues are all non-negative. So let me sort them, starting at 0. The next cool property is that the number of connected components of the graph is the number of 0 eigenvalues. The eigenvalues count the number of connected components. So let's just see why that is. I mean, there is a proof on that web page. But let's look at this guy. What are, the what are the column sums of this matrix? They all add up to 0, right? Because there's a, there's a 1 and a negative 1. So that means that this guy's column sums are also 0. Right? So this guy has a null vector, which is the vector of all 1s. Now, if I had two copies of this, if I had two disconnected components that both looked like this, I'd have two of these guys, and I'd have two different null vectors. All ones for this, and all ones for the other block. So for every connected component, I get a null vector, which is just basically all ones for those vertices, and zero for everybody else. So this is the first simplest connection. Is that um, something funny going on up there? So is there a, something flying around? Oh, OK, OK. So. Oh, I'm just wondering if we have drones in here. Who knows? <laughs> so, <laughs> so, so this is the first connection between gra a nice graph property and linear algebra. Just count the number of zero eigenvalues. And the other one is that the, se so the second largest eigenvalue tells you how connected it is. So if it were zero, that would tell me I'd have at least two connected components. But it turns out its size, the bigger lambda 2 is, the more connected my graph will be. It's going to tell me how many edges I have to cut to in my graph partition. OK. So here is the algorithm. I'm going to build my Laplacian in my graph. I'm going to compute the eigenvector for the second largest eigenvalue, you know, the second mode of vibration. I'm going to look at in, in each of the, this, so this is going to be a vector with one number for each vertex. And I'm just going to look and see whether it's positive or negative. You know, is it up or down? And I'll put the negatives in one partition and the positives in the other. So it's, it's just the, the vibrating string notation. So, so why is this a good idea? There are three theorems, or three results of Fiedler, that say why this is a great idea. The first question you might ask is, you know, once I do this partitioning, 
um, do I, are these two components even connected, right? I mean, I could imagine a really terrible partition where every other vertex was in N0, N minus, and every other vertex was in N plus, so that they weren't even, you know, it was a terrible partition because everybody was connected to the other side. Well, it turns out that if you do it this way, that both of these are connected to one another. Everybody in N minus is connected, there's a path, and everybody in N plus is connected. So it's a, it's a natural partition from that point of view. And the second theorem says is that lambda 2 is sort of a monotonic function of how many edges are in the graph. So if I take my graph and I take out an edge, I make it less connected, then lambda 2 decreases. So lambda 2 tells me monotonically how many edges I have to take out of my graph in order to partition it. But there's even a better theorem. What he proved is that Lambda 2 gives you a guaranteed lower bound on the size of the partition. The number of edges that you have to uh, cut to get these guys separated is proportional to Lambda 2. So, lambda two so, so if Lambda 2 is very small, it says that you have a really great partition. And, and if Lambda 2 is large, that says that you know, the thing is very strongly connected. So, so Lambda 2 is a very good indicator of whether this is a good partition or not. And so that is the theory, none of which necessarily has to show up in the algorithm, but it sort of justifies why it's a reasonable algorithm beyond just the basic intuition of a vibrating string. So let me now, uh, you know, fill in the details. Are there any questions before I fill in the de details of the algorithm? So um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take my, um, I'll do it for a string first, and I will show you then how it works in general. And so what we've basically done is we've taken this string and we've written, we've pretended it's a vibrating string. So for every edge, um, there's a spring between it of, of a constant, uh, spring constant. I'm going to write down, you know, f equals ma for this vibrating string. I'll find the eigenvalues and eigenvectors and I'm going to get the Laplacian of this graph, right? So I just, I just want to now do the physics approach and actually see the Laplacian of the graph actually pop out. So, so here is the, well, I'm going to write down f equals ma, and so here's my vibrating string. And so I'm going to assume that the force that connects vertex x1 and x2 is just proportional to x1 minus x2. So I get a spring on the left and I get a spring on the right, and they're pulling in opposite directions. And then I write down mass times acceleration equals the force. And I see this is a linear function of all of the vertices. So let me just write it as a matrix vector multiply. So there are all the, the positions. There's mass times acceleration, and out pops almost the Laplacian of the graph. Okay? And so uh, I will make it the real Laplacian in a second, but you can see there's twos and minus ones, the degrees except for these corners, and then connectivity. So how do I solve the, uh, that? I want to solve, so now I have mass divided by spring constant, x double dot equals Laplacian, almost Laplacian times x. I want to Fine, you know, I, I ask, what are the modes of vibration? So I'll just plug in the usual uh, solution. I'll say there's a constant mode of vibration whose shape is x naught, and it has some, it vibrates with frequency alpha. I don't know what that is. So let me plug in x of t into this differential equation. And when I do that, it turns out that alpha tells me the eigenvalue of the matrix, and x naught is the eigenvector. And so this is the matrix that we looked at in great detail before I know all of its eigenvalues and eigenvectors. And so it turns out they're just sine curves. There they are. And the frequencies are just given by that closed form formula, and it's you know, simple linear algebra. And so what I want, and again, I just want to pick the second lowest frequency. So, so I'm trying to make this analogy with physics, and this is not quite the Laplacian of a 1D mesh. And so I want to just change it very slightly to make it a perfect analogy. And so it's not going to be a vibrating string where the endpoints are tied down. It's going to be a vibrating string like this. So I have these bars, and I have something, that, a little ring that can slide on the bars, and these are connected by strings. So now, and I ask, how does this vibrate in and out? Okay, so now this is, this is still a vibrating string, but these guys aren't tied down to anything. And if I write down the f equals ma for this, I get exactly the Laplacian for how these things vibrate in and out. So what are the basic modes of vibration for this particular vibrating string? Well, the simplest thing is it just moves back and forth. Everybody has a constant. That's the zero eigenvalue. And so there's a plot of the eigenvector. It's just all constant. 
because we know all ones is, is an eigenvector. Here's eigenvector two. This is the one that we want. This tells me how to partition. It's all plus on one side, all negative in the other, zero in the middle. So this gives me the perfect partition. There's a third eigenvector and so forth. So what happens when I go to higher dimensions and I do other things? Uh, so let me just now do a 2D mesh and ask ourselves what the algorithm tells us. So here I have a two-dimensional mesh. Everybody's connected to their nearest neighbors. And so I have a trampoline, kind of a broken trampoline. I'm going to still write down you know, Laplacian for this. And so the question is, what graph partitioning do I get out of this? Um, so here is the answer. So here's the original graph. Here is the second eigenvector sort of looked at from above. It's a little hard to tell. So here I've shown it from above where I have circled the positive vertices and left the uncircled vertices. They're negative. So this flap is coming up and that flap is going down. And if I look at it on an edge on, you can see this flap, there, it's sort of bending up, so it's sort of vibrating like this. And there it's going up, there it's going up, there it's going down, there it's going down, and there's the top view, which is a little hard to see. So that's the answer that you get for this broken trampoline. That's how it partitions it. So the, the, the partition is right along that edge there, which seems like a perfectly natural place to partition it. And some people, as I said, get aggressive, and they say, well, I'll take the fourth eigenvector, and I'll break it up into these disjoint pieces, and now I get four partitions, where it goes up, up, down, down, and they're all disconnected. So some people try to break it up into four right away. But as I said, we're happy to do graph partitioning by section into just two. So I'm almost done with this part of the talk. So, so, how do, so now I've written down my matrix. I've written down my graph Laplacian. I said there's an algorithm that we actually need to run that finds the second largest eigenvector. It's called Lanchos. Here it is without too much detail on one slide, just to tell you where the time goes. It's an iterative procedure that does repeated sparse matrix vector multiply. As a, again, it's a chicken and egg problem. And so what I do repeatedly is I take a vector that's kind of a starting guess for an eigenvector. I, do, I scale it, so there's a Blas1 operation. I do a matrix vector multiply with it. And then I do a bunch of other Blas operations. And I build iteratively this tridiagonal matrix which approximates my original one. My original one is huge. This guy is small. But its eigenvalues turn out to be good approximations to the eigenvalues of the original one. This will be a topic of a later lecture, but take my word for it right now that basically you, you find this little tiny tridiagonal matrix, its eigenvalues and eigenvectors we use to approximate the original ones. And uh, so that's how the algorithm works. So to summarize, the Laplacian matrix represents connectivity. You know, who's connected to whom? Minus ones for all the non-zeros. And the second eigenvector corresponds to the second mode of vibration, and that gives us a graph bisection problem. And uh, the, in lambda 2, the second largest eigenvalue, is sort of directly proportional to how connected the graph is. How do we do it? We, we're going to implement it with a Lanchos algorithm. That means all we do is sparse matrix vector multiplies, and we have this chicken and egg problem. But we're going to do this a bunch of times, and hopefully we're going to need to do, um, you know, do it many fewer times in the uh, eventual algorithm. We'll need to do it a lot more. So I will stop there, and next time we'll make it all run a lot faster by using this multi-level acceleration idea, by doing it all recursively on a sequence of smaller graphs. OK, any questions before we uh, leave? OK.